Good morning, everyone. Hey, Garth. Hey. hey Shannon. How you doing Hello. Good. Good, good. Hey, Shannon. Hi, how's it going? Uh, do we have Ken? Let me check. I don't see him yet. Keep an eye on the waiting room. There's one. Yeah, it looks like Ken's not here yet, so give me a couple minutes. He did say he has joined. Oh, oh, yes, I see him. I'll admit him. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. Hi, Ken. Just a reminder okay. for everyone on the call, we are. Uh, we're going to be recording this session. There we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right. Um, yeah, I think we can <clears throat> go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Shannon. I'm just going to quickly introduce the Chicago Space Network. Um, and then um, I'll hand it off to Gaurav. Um, so thanks for everyone for joining us today. Um, so. Um, this talk is part of our monthly series of space talks um, and our group, is the Chicago Space Network, um, which is an alumni affinity group um, where we connect Chicago students, alumni, and everyone who's interested in space. Um, a lot of like networking, um, career development, guidance um, is part of this group's goal, as well as business development, um, mentoring, and collaboration between um, people who have an interest in space. Um, so we're very excited to have Ken talk to us today and um, I'll hand it over to Gaurav to introduce Ken. Thanks Shannon and uh, welcome everyone to the to the space talk. Uh, this is a special one and we are sorry for a few minutes of delay. We had some uh, admin issues, um, but this is a special space talk where we are going to speak about astronomy and we are really grateful that today we have got Ken uh, joining us, uh, taking time from his busy schedule on a, on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, Dr. Kenneth Sembach, he is a Director Emeritus of the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is an 800-person multi-mission operations center for NASA. Dr. Sembach has been deeply involved in scientific operation and managerial aspects of the Hubble Space Telescope for nearly two decades and has been closely working with the government, corporate, academic, international, and public partners in, in, in that role. He holds the PhD in astronomy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a bachelor's degree with honors in physics from the University of Chicago. He was a Hubble fellow at MIT uh, before becoming the deputy project scientist at the John Hopkins University in 1996. Dr. Sembach has been conferred a number of awards during his outstanding experience in astronomy, including the Newton Lacey Pierce Prize of the American Astronomical Society in 2001. In 2010, he was awarded the NASA Exceptional Public Service Medal for his work on the last Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission. And he has also been inducted into the John Hopkins Society of Scholars in 2014. Uh, Dr. Sembach's scientific interests include physical properties of diffuse interstellar and intergalactic matter. And we'll be talking a lot about that. And, and he has authored or co-authored more than 170 papers in, in, in journals and has contributed to, to hundreds of scientific conference presentation. Um, so very outstanding track record and and we are really grateful to, to have Dr. Sembak here. So welcome, Dr. Sembak. Thank you, Gaurav and Shannon. It's a pleasure to be here today. Excellent. And uh, you know, as, as we generally do with our space talks, we are going to spend around 45 minutes talking about um, Dr. Sembak's um, uh, experience, his research interests, and also his guidance for the space community of University of Chicago, as well as its, uh, you know, alumni and friends. 
Um, so to get it started, uh, Dr. Semvak, do you mind speaking a bit about your background and experience of the key decisions in your uh, in your life, and you know how did you go about those uh, those decisions? Sure. So a um, couple of key decisions, I think. Uh, one was going to the University of Chicago. That was a big one for me. Um, it was really the place that I wanted to do my undergraduate work and was one of the few schools I applied to. Um, so it's good that I got in. Um, I had a good four years there and then went to uh, Madison, as you mentioned earlier, for my thesis work. That too was a good decision. And in fact, I had been planning on staying at Chicago or had at least been offered the opportunity to stay at Chicago to do my graduate work. And my advisor at the time, Don York, said, you know, I'd love to have you stay, but um, it really would be good to go and see something else, uh, you know, experience a different different school. And so for the students out there thinking about graduate school, I, I think that's good advice. As much as you might like to stay at the U of C for graduate work, um, it's good to get out in the world and see how others do things. So I spent the time in Madison um, and then was fortunate enough to receive a Hubble Fellowship for it uh, and chose to go to MIT. Uh, school completely um, different for me from Madison, um, as you can imagine, uh, very intense and um, very different kind of astronomy happening there than I was uh, exposed to in Madison and Chicago. And so um, I think, you know, just as a general piece of advice there, it's good to good to explore different opportunities and to 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 move out in new directions if you can as a student. Um, I had thought at one point about um, going to Johns Hopkins as a graduate or as a as a Hubble fellow, and I decided to go to MIT instead. But it's interesting that I turned around that I came back to Hopkins, um, and I worked on a mission called the Far Ultraviolet Spectroscopic Explorer there, which was a small medium size small to medium sized NASA mission that was actually run out of the university, out of the physics and astronomy department there. And so we had a small group of people that was running what turned out to be a very successful observatory. And that gave me a lot of hands-on experience, both with the science program planning, as well as the actual operations of observatories in space. Um, I had done quite a bit of work with ground-based observatories, and I had actually been helping with some of the Hubble commissioning, um, the original Hubble commissioning as a graduate student. But working on... Um, the far ultraviolet spectroscopic explorer was really a hands-on um, experience that was different from any of that. Um, at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which I transferred over to about five years after that, I started as an instrument scientist there on one of the new instruments for the um, last Hubble servicing mission. And as part of that, really got to work with a lot of engineers both um, in the Institute, as well as at Goddard Space Flight Center and Ball Aerospace, uh, who was building the instrument uh, for the University of Colorado at the time. And so I spent a lot of time in Colorado and got to work with a lot of really different people. And that was a superb experience um, because it showed just the breadth and depth of knowledge that's necessary in order to bring a complicated instrument uh, like those on Hubble or on web to fruition and to make sure that they really work properly. Um, I never sought out being director of the Institute. That's something that just kind of evolved as part of my overall um, career trajectory. After working on some of the Hubble instruments and leading a few of the Hubble teams, um, I actually became the mission head at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which meant that I had uh, responsibility for operating the mission and um, making sure that our team of 170, 100, 180 people was prepared to do what was necessary to keep the Hubble data flowing out to the community. Um, the opportunity to become director was something that I just, I applied for, um, thinking it would be a good experience. I was actually selected and for seven years then, uh, my main focus was to make sure that Webb got off the ground uh, running with science on day one. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So um, some choices deliberate, some just kind of fall into your lap. Um, 
and you know opportunities out there i think when it knocks you should answer the door thank you dr sembag that's a uh, uh, great experience and uh, very wise advice uh, you have also led you know the the, the hubble telescope mission and um, and you know and and being in nasa managing so many different kind of stakeholders with very different preferences and and constraints uh, can you talk a bit about you know the the key leadership lessons which you learned and and would like to share during that that experience um sure it's really important i think to realize that um the space business is really a multidisciplinary business and uh i think the key the key thing that i'd like to communicate is that a lot of what gets done almost all of what gets done is too big or too complicated for any single individual or even organization to undertake by itself and so having that multidisciplinary multi um organizational approach to um attacking problems solving them uh coming up with new ideas making big things happen uh it really does take a lot of coordination and making sure that um you're communicating with your partners and uh those are partners across not just academia and government but in industry uh in government um in in politics as well there are a lot of different stakeholders that are at the table for these things space space is an opportunity that a lot of people and a lot of different organizations have a big have a big part in yeah absolutely and you know we are doing our best as a uh, as the community to you know to also contribute towards um uh, uh, towards creating that that awareness and creating that platform to to share the learnings and and opportunities um and and dr sembak uh, can you also speak a bit about how have you seen astro astronomy science uh, and research changing over the last 20 to 30 years and 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 where it is heading to and you know then we can move to your to your research interests yeah there've been a couple of phase changes in the field over the last 30 years um one really big change occurred when hubble was launched um that opened up a whole new universe for all kinds of opportunities um there was a universe out there that we hadn't seen before and so um coordination of observations among observatories it really even though hubble's wavelength range that it could observe ultraviolet and near infrared is fairly limited on the electromagnetic spectrum it really showed that um having that solid core piece of information could be a, a, a stepping stone for building at other wavelengths and so that multi wavelength approach to astronomy really took off with Hubble and the great observatories like Spitzer and Chandra um and just in terms of what could be done and what could be learned I mean Hubble changed our opinion about so much of that whether the universe is static versus expanding how fast it's expanding how big it is how old it is all of that um black holes star fo formation all kinds of things um and so the push to larger observatories was obvious and um that was you know one of the reasons that web came about for example so there was this phase shift to push into more ambitious programs uh, more expensive more complicated more difficult uh programs to explore the universe it's the way you push the boundaries um more recently there's been a phase change as well to go back to smaller things as well um the small sats and the cube sats and um some of the smaller kinds of things that are being enabled by uh multiple launch capabilities and just the improvements in technology whether it's um um circuitry or um you know microprocessors uh, we're able to look at the universe in a different way on the other end of the the cost and and risk scale 
if you will. And that's opened up a lot of opportunities too. Um, these things are in many ways complementary, um, but they're very different. And so um, I think the, the key there is that there's a lot of opportunity. It remains to be seen how far we can push in either direction, how small we can go or how large we can go. Um, I suspect those boundaries will be challenged in the next five to 10, 15 years. It's also interesting that there seems to be a lot more um, philanthropic interest in space and the kinds of things that people are talking about doing now with smaller experiments, given that some of these um, other capabilities have opened up. Um, on, the, on the heavy side, you know, phase change rocket uh, technology has improved dramatically in the last 10 years. So um, limiting factors like mass aren't as limiting as they used to be. I mean, when you look at, say, the history of the web program, uh, early on in the web program, we were fighting for every pound we could on that observatory because there were mass constraints. Now, it turns out we didn't actually have a mass problem in the end, but um, with newer newer rocketry and lift capabilities, heavy launch capabilities, um, when you don't have that mass uh, limitation, a lot of other possibilities open up as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Sembach, do you would you like to now talk a bit about your, your current research interests and topics? I think you can share your screen um, if you would like to present um, slides. Sure. So, um, uh, let me just see how I do that here real quick. Um, let me just see if I can, um, see if I can yep. share my desktop. Yeah. And then this, can you see? Yes, we can. I think if you go on full screen, we can see the entire slide. Now we are seeing it in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. How do I do that? You're seeing it. How about that? Uh, we are also seeing the the speaker notes. Um, uh, see, I okay. Um, how do I change that? I think at the bottom corner, uh, you know the. The one, yep, the, the one next to that, I think that's the icon. This one? Yep. yep. Oh, it's still. Uh... It's still doing that. Oh, nuts. Um, let me try it this way. How's that? Yeah. It's that still cool, but you know, we can, yeah, we can, we can, we can. Uh, Continue on this. We we can see the slides. Okay, let's do that. Um, sorry, it looks fine on mine. So I, I'd like to talk about web for just a few minutes before uh, getting into. If it's okay, actually, sorry, Dr. Simbach, to inter interrupt you. If you if you hit escape, um, yeah. very quickly. Yeah. And you go to uh, the slideshow tab uh, that's in um, PowerPoint. Yes. Um, yeah. On that. And if you go to. Um, uh, uh let's see should be yes i think if you click on custom show yeah oh no. sorry close that um uh i i would you happen to have or uh, you have two uh monitors that your home set up yeah let me see uh, if it, that. If you switch to um, just the single monitor, so if you have this as your main monitor and and don't extend your monitors, yeah, let's see if that works. Um, and then you play from start. I think that should allow you to uh, avoid um, the presenter view. There we go. Yep. That Perfect. worked. All right. Yeah, it was just the the two monitors. Um, sorry about that. Um, okay, so let's talk about web for just a few minutes, um, so that. Um, we can set the stage there and then I'll say a little bit about my research interests as well. So just again, for everybody, um, everybody online probably knows about web, but um, this is NASA's next 
a great observatory here. It's located out at the second Lagrange point, about a million kilometers, one and a half million kilometers, a million miles from Earth. It's an infrared telescope that's designed to detect very faint levels of infrared radiation and heat and was ostensibly designed initially to study the very distant universe, to see what was beyond Hubble's grasp. And people were talking about that even before Hubble was launched in 1990. The first conferences that led to, to Webb were back in the late 1980s. So it's got um, a five layer sun shield. This is a mylar like material that um, keeps the telescope cold uh, because the sun and the moon are um, always kept to the bottom side of that in the way that the observatory points. And so the telescope is looking out into cold space. And you can see um, just in the chart there, the temperature difference between the two sides, the, the cold sides at about minus 380. Fahrenheit and the hot sides at about 185 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's nearly 500 degrees or more, 600 degrees um, Fahrenheit difference from the back to the front. And that allows the observatory to collect light that's very faint and not see its own radiation in infrared because after all infrared radiation is heat. Um, here's a view of the observatory when it was in uh, ground testing and vinyl configuration out at uh, Northrop Grumman out in Redondo Beach, California back in December 2020, a year or so before it launched. And that's just to give you a real world view of what the observatory looked like, both in its deployed configuration, as well as in the lower right there, the stowed configuration to go into the, the rocket shroud um, before, uh, before launch. Now, Webb was designed to answer a couple of really fundamental questions. Um, what was the universe like when it was very young? When were the first stars and galaxies formed, for example? How did it evolve? So how did those galaxies change with time? How do stars and planets form? Interestingly enough, we've known and have been studying star formation for 100 plus years, but we still don't know exactly how that happens. Uh, Webb will definitely give us insight there. And then is Earth the only place where life exists? So that's an age old question. Um, sometimes this is cast in terms of Webb looking at exoplanets um, or planetary systems and the conditions for life. Um, it's interesting to note that at the time Webb was first thought about, there were no exoplanets known. We figured there must be planets around other stars, but the first one wasn't discovered until 1992 or so. Um, and so while the observatory was originally designed for deep universe studies, it turns out that it's actually quite good at uh, observing conditions for life in others, other planetary systems. And that didn't just happen by accident, that came about through some deliberate planning later on in its evolution. So there are all kinds of things that Webb has already done to address these four pillars of science that it's built on. Um, whether it's doing deep field imaging or looking at the origin and evolution of elements, something that I'm particularly interested in. Um, it's been looking into stellar nurseries. I'll show you a picture of the anniversary, the one year anniversary image a little bit later. That is a great example of that. And of course, it has been looking at what's happening not only in our own solar system, but in the systems of planets around other stars. We'll talk a few minutes about that. So this image is a galaxy cluster image that um, was taken early on in Hubble's um, in Hubble's or in in uh, Webb's operation, and it's a cluster of galaxies at about four and a half billion light years from Earth, and this mass of galaxies, this giant concentration of galaxies, which you see at the center of this image, actually warps the space that it sits in. This is Einstein's mass distorts space time continuum hypothesis. You can see just by looking at this image that he was right. There are these long streaks and arcs that are um, distant background galaxies further than the cluster that get warped into these um, filamentary segments as the light bends through that warped space time. And you can see this in a bunch of different locations on this image. Sometimes you can even see that occurring 
on the level of light being bent even as it's coming around individual galaxies, which is pretty spectacular. This image here, it turns out, is actually deeper than the deepest image that Hubble ever obtained. And it was only about 12 or 14 hours in, in duration, the exposure. And so um, we knew early on that when Webb was looking at the sky, number one, there was never going to be a blank piece of sky that it observed. It was always going to be seeing something, uh, mostly galaxies and many different kinds of galaxies. And this one image really captures that in a lot of detail. Also, this one little red dot in here in this image is one of the most distant objects that's ever been observed. It's with, it was formed uh, more than 13 billion years ago, just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And this is the kind of thing that Webb is really um, designed to look for, those faint, really small blobs in the early universe. And turns out now, as more observations have been coming in, Webb's been finding more and more, um, more and more of these. And in fact, so many that it's starting to change what we think about early star formation in the universe. This slide's a comparison of Hubble's deepest image, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which was about 270 hours of exposure, compared with Webb observations of the same field, which was about 20. And you can see that um, for the most part, those two images are the same or look very much the same. You see the same galaxies in them in only a tenth the time with Webb. So it really is, is powerful. That isn't to say that Hubble isn't necessary. Hubble's looking at a different wavelength range. So the two are very complementary, um, but it's a good demonstration of Webb's detection power here. This is a recent image that was released just um, within the last few weeks. This is a pair of colliding galaxies and addresses and goes to that heart of how do galaxies evolve with time? Well, they run into each other, they interact. Here you have two galaxies right at the core of this image that are interacting and you see all of this material, this gas and dust and other stuff that's been flung out into that intergalactic, circumgalactic medium in these long trails and tails that um, are based on the kinematics and the dynamics of what's going on in this particular system. And this changes the nature of those galaxies um, as they move forward in time. And so it triggers star formation, it strips matter out, it's, it, it accretes matter. Um, those galaxies will be forever changed compared to what they were before this particular interaction happened. And so you can study this kind of um, interaction in great detail with web sensitivity and both its cameras, the mid-infrared camera as well as the near-infrared camera. One of the things I'm particularly interested in is the creation and distribution of elements, um, not just in the interstellar medium of our own galaxy, but in the intergalactic medium and as a function of time. And basically every element other than hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium and beryllium that were created in the Big Bang is formed either in stars or in the aftermaths of stars' explosions. So the air we're breathing, the, the, the oxygen, the nitrogen in the air, the carbon in the trees, the sand on our beaches, the silicon in the sand, the calcium in our teeth, the gold in the mirror of Webb's telescopes, um, all of it was created at one point inside a star or in that stellar explosion. And so, you know, Carl Sagan was right. We're all made of star stuff. Um, but there are many, many generations of this material inside and outside of stars. So you're sitting here today listening to this talk, but parts of you, parts of those at you, those atoms that make you up have been inside stars before, which is kind of an amazing thing to think about. This image here um, is an image that was just released for the first anniversary in July. Uh, this is the Ro Ophiuchi star forming region. It's the closest star forming region to the um, Earth. It's a very beautiful image, um, just aesthetically, but there's a lot going on here. Um, the star right down in kind of the lower middle center is really carving out this region of gas um, that it sits in, and you can see that three dimensional. Um, just complex nature. You can see in the red there, there are jets being, jets of gas being spewed out of other stars. This is a very young um, star forming region. It's very similar 
to the kind of cloud that the sun formed out of. There are a lot of sun-like stars in this particular region. And so having an up close view of this at only a few hundred light years away uh, with Webb is gonna really tell us more about the kinds of conditions that lead to star formation in environments like our own sun formed in. And with Webb, you can see right into the right into these regions, um, even if they're obscured by dust because the infrared light is able to get in and out of those regions, uh, much easier than say the visible light that Hubble can see. And then finally, just, you know, more recently, um, Webb's been looking at various exoplanet systems. Um, the most famous in one is the TRAPPIST system, the TRAPPIST-1 system, which has um, seven star, uh, seven planets that are kind of Earth-sized or a little bit bigger, um, orbiting a, 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 an M star, uh, a, a cooler star than our sun, but um, still, with these planets in their various configurations, some of them are in zones that could potentially be habitable uh, for life. And so it's interesting to determine if it's possible by looking at their atmospheres, we could learn about whether or not that might even be a possibility. Um, Webb's looked at two of those systems now, the, the, the 1B and the 1C, the two planets that are closest to the star. And um, interestingly enough, what it does is you look at the star when the uh, planet is being obscured by the star. So this, this system is also unique in that it has a, a plane for the orbital rotation that's more or less aligned with the Earth star sight line. So the planets transit in front of the, the star every now and then on the order of days. It's, it's quick. They're going around the star very quickly. So you can see them when they're in uh, front of the star, in back of the star, and on the sides. And you can measure the amount of heat or the brightness in the infrared that you're basically seeing at those different phases. And you can make a model for how hot the star is as a result of that, or and uh, sorry, how hot the planet is as a result of that. And when you take that model and you compare it to what you think it should be, or what Earth would be like, for example, um, you find that in fact for those two star, for those two planets that are closest to the star, they uh, are probably too hot to sustain any kind of lifelike conditions. They have tidally locked rotations, meaning they always have the same side facing the star, and in if they had an atmosphere the atmosphere would distribute heat around the planet. Um, and we don't see that, the, the temperatures are high enough that we can say the, the, um, the planet isn't distributing heat. So we know they don't have uh, much in the way of an atmosphere that would be able to support uh, lifelike conditions. In these cases, the temperatures measured are over 400 degrees, Kel uh, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 500 degrees Kelvin or so. So we'll keep looking, uh, and there are many such systems that we can do this kind of analysis for, as well as actually look at the constituents within the atmospheres. Um, some people have been looking at uh, the composition of other atmospheres already and looking to see if, for example, they're Earth-like or Venus-like. Um, and so there'll be a lot of that done in the next year or so. And then in our own solar system, we're able to look at planets in detail that we haven't been able to see before. For example, this is a this one is a fairly recent observation of Neptune, which was taken earlier this year. And you can see the weather and clouds and systems that are there, in addition to the beautiful rings that just light up um, in, in the infrared, the dust and the gas in the rings, even though they're very faint and difficult, really difficult to see um, with other telescopes, including Hubble. Um, they show up very, very nicely here in web with very little exposure time. And so we're gonna really learn a lot about this, the planets in our own solar system as well. So there's a lot more coming. I could talk for an hour or more, but I won't, because I know you wanna ask some more questions and we wanna definitely get people asking questions. Um, if you wanna learn more about what Hubble's looking at, go to webtelescope.org. You can look at this 
the new images, the, the press releases and so on. There's lots to see there. A lot of videos and other information as well. So I think with that, I'll turn it back over to Gurav. Um, I need to figure out how to stop sharing, which I've done. And I'll put my video back up. There we go. Thanks a lot, um, Dr. Sembeck. Um, we'll pause a bit here to see if there are questions from, from the audience on what we just heard. No? Hi, Garab. This is uh, Travis. Uh, here, I'll turn on my video for a second. I, I have a kickoff question for, for Dr. Samba, if that's all right. Um, hi, Dr. Samba. Thank you. Thank I, you for sure. talking us through the web. Uh, it's past year. Um, I was curious. I, I can imagine with research and just our formation uh, that one of the biggest challenges is the the time length um, that it could take to really be able to see a, a full sort of timeline from start to finish of how how stars form. So with with Webb is is the, is the idea behind studying star formation with a telescope like Webb to try to find uh, as many different snapshots of star formation at different phases and try to combine them together to create the full timeline of what the process might be? Or is there more research and theory going on behind the scenes to understand um, uh, how, how what's actually happening and whether or not there may be different ways that stars can form in those types of clusters? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you definitely want to take snapshots at different of different aged star formation regions um, because you can't you can't wait hundreds of millions of years or a billion years, right? We don't. None of us have that kind of time. Uh, so you you do um, want to look at as many different kinds of star forming regions um, as you can, and the the power of Webb is that um, especially for the really young systems that are really heavily shrouded in dust where the stars haven't blown away all of that material to expose what's going on down deep in the cores. Um, Webb allows you to go deeper into those younger regions and so it's filling in a critical piece of that history, a piece of that time when the stars themselves are just turning on, they're very active, they're starting to spew jets. They're starting to interact with that surrounding medium that eventually becomes, say, a disk of material that turns into planets and so on. And so, by looking at seeing, it, that's one of the key. That's one of the key times that's really difficult to model until you have some good information, because otherwise, everything is the proverbial spherical cow, right? You, 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 you're simp Everything is simplified to the point where it may not be realistic anymore but when you have real data like that then you can start to to test the theories and the models that you have um i've told many of my colleagues i said if we don't understand star formation in 10 years i don't think we're ever going to understand it because there are a lot of different observatories not just web but the alma the atacama large millimeter array uh, we still have hubble uh, we've got a lot of other kinds of resources being applied to this problem now. We know the distances of stars precisely now from the Gaia Observatory, the European Gaia Observatory, which is a critical piece of information in understanding their physical properties. So if we don't know a lot more about star formation in 10 years, something is seriously wrong. But Webb Web will, Web will be front and center in that. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Shambach. And we have another question around the advice to the high school students. Uh, so, you know, we can transition to the, it's a good segue into the last portion of our talk. Um, any any guidance advice, uh, Dr. Shambach, for, for high school students, for college students, for entrepreneurs, uh, 
who are you know who are our our audience and uh, and members of our of our community yeah so let's start with high school um that's a great time to get involved with um local clubs um, depending on where you live, you may have the opportunity to visit or even take classes at a planetarium. I was fortunate to be in the Chicago area when I was growing up. Um, I had a sister who had a job where she worked down downtown on Friday, uh, on Saturdays. So on Saturday mornings, I would go down to the Adler Planetarium and take a class down there. Um, and I loved that. Uh, it was a great way to not just learn about the universe, but also to meet people, uh, people my age who had similar interests, but also say the professors, uh, many at the time were professors from the University of Chicago or the University of Illinois teaching Northwestern teaching down at the planetarium on their weekends. Um, so I would say for high school students get involved. Um, definitely, uh, it helps if you have a good science, especially physics and chemistry uh, and mathematics background. Um, so hopefully, um, uh, you know, the high school students we're talking about here have access to good, uh, good classes, AP classes, or just really good teachers, um, in high school, because a lot of what you will study to become more involved in astronomy and astrophysics requires a good physics and math background. And so, um, I would say those would be the kinds of pieces of advice I I would give to high school students and just say, stick with it. Um, but look at, look for those opportunities in your local neighborhoods as well. Um, for undergraduates, it's all about perseverance and all the UFC students ought to know that, right? Um, I took physics right away when I came to the University of Chicago. And after my first semester, um, my grades were not so great. And I was told in no uncertain terms, maybe you ought to think about a different area of study. And that really snapped me into thinking, geez, something I really love and want to do. Um, I'm not making it here. Um, and so I buckled down and, um, you know, that was a wake up call for me and did really well after that. Um, so it took a lot of hard work. Uh, I worked with a tutor for a while. I worked with my um, dorm mates for problem sets. Just stick with it and persevere. If there's something that you really want to do, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. Just stick with it and do it. Um, you got it in you. Uh, just keep pressing forward. For later stage, for graduate students, um, Pick a, pick a school that you're comfortable at. You're going to be spending a lot of time working with people in that department um, and with the other students. So I absolutely think you should visit the schools uh, that you want to go to. Um, make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure that you have multiple people familiar with your work that you're not dependent on one person for references for jobs after graduate school. Um, this is particularly important for women, um, but it applies uh, for men as well. It's always good to work with multiple um, professors, postdocs, whomever. They don't all have to be in the same department, but um, make sure there are people that can write you references in case there's an issue with one of the people um, that you do work with. No one wants to think that that will ever happen, but um, I've seen it happen uh, to people, and you really do need that that backup. Um, there too, work hard, seek out opportunities, um, and explore different possibilities, things that um, you really are interested in and really want to do. Um, don't think that the first thing that you do is a, something that you have to do for the rest of your career. For postdocs, I would say um, postdoc is about building networks. Um, you know, obviously, you've got to work hard for uh, your research to build up your reputation and so on. So, you know, get out, get get to conferences, 
talk to people at conferences, make those connections, um, whether it's people your own age or 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 um, older people in the field that are doing similar things or even different things. Um, it's really important to make those connections because you never know when one of them might give you a call and say, hey, we've got a job. We think you'd be a perfect candidate. Um, it's still the best way to figure out and to find a job in the field. It's a small enough field that word of mouth is still really important. Um, LinkedIn is great, but it's not everything. Um, and so um, make sure you're talking with people. Thanks a lot, um, Dr. Sembak. And another, uh, you know, uh, another question uh, along those lines, what do you see any, um, what are the kind of challenges and obstacles you are seeing um, around the development and of astronomy and you know creating more awareness and 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 programs and what are the kind of solutions which uh, which you have been you know advocating for or think could be could be implemented to make it better and solve some of those challenges um I think one of the challenges is for astronomy is still um, what is its application? And the simple fact is that an education in astronomy, astrophysics can be applied to all different kinds of fields. And I think a lot of a lot of students and a lot of professors still don't realize that. There's there's a one of the challenges is getting people out of the mindset that the only possible path forward in astronomy is to go into academia and to be a professor. Um, that's the mindset that I had early on in my career. And um, I never became a professor where I was teaching classes on a weekly basis. Um, there are a lot of other opportunities um, to apply your talents, not just to the space business, but to other fields. Um, within the space business, there are organizations, the government centers, industry, um, research centers such as my own Space Telescope Science Institute or Infrared Processing Analysis Center out in California that hire many people um, in the field of all different kinds of talents. So um, that's something to think about. So astronomy astrophysics, you have a core STEM background, which can be applied um, not just within the astronomical field, but earth sciences, heliophysics, planetary sciences, banking, uh, different engineering disciplines. Um, there are all kinds of things that you can go on and do. I've had classmates and others go on. They're all over the world doing all different kinds of things, um, not all of them in the field of astronomy. Similarly, the field of astronomy is dependent on people without that don't have astronomy and astrophysics degrees. I just mentioned one, engineering. Um, we could not do what we do today without engineers, mechanical engineers, optical engineers, electrical engineers, systems engineers, software engineers, et cetera. Um, an example there, um, as director of the Institute, um, 800 people, about 120 or 150 of them may be scientists, 300 of them engineers. So it, there's, um, there's a need for other kinds of interaction and multidisciplinary work that goes on. Um, outreach specialists, educators, graphic artists, um, IT people, I, you know, just data science uh, is, a bigger part of astronomy now as traditional astronomical background, um, all different kinds. So I think it's important to just keep that in mind. There's something for everybody. <laughs> you just have to find that right niche. Um, but it's also, if you do get an astronomy and astrophysics background, there are a lot of different things you can do as well. Thanks, Dr. Simbeck. And we have another question from Jim. Jim, would you like to go off mute and ask the question? Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you very much. This has been uh, just uh, a really enlightening and uh, wonderful uh, afternoon. So thank you very much. I, I was curious about, um, I'm an amateur stargazer. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll just preface it with that. But um, I, I've, uh, as I've been getting more and more uh, in, uh, you know, into this area, I've been really surprised by the number of new terrestrial telescopes and, and space scopes that are coming online. And I was wondering how all that work gets coordinated and uh, what you're anticipating the most over the next few years. Yeah, so um, I see your comment in the, in the chat as well. And you mentioned Euclid in particular. So, um, Euclid is a wide field observatory that the European Space Agency just launched um, a week or two ago. And that'll provide some really interesting wide field views of the universe. That'll be really um, important to coordinate with what Webb and Hubble are doing, for example, because it's like having a wide field pair of binoculars and then, you know, having a broad view of things being able to set the context for what you see along those pencil lines of sight that Hubble or Webb can look along. So you can go deep with Hubble or Webb, or you can go wide with Euclid. Um, the Nancy Roman Space Telescope is one that's also coming. NASA is going to be launching that in 2026, 2027. That's an infrared um, wide field observatory as well. And that'll be a great complement to Euclid. So those Euclid works mostly at visible wavelengths. Roman will work mostly at infrared wavelengths. Um, and then you'll have Hubble and, and Webb together looking deep. So the combination of those observatories um, gives us an ability to probe physics both on the broad view scale as well as on the, the very narrow um, scale. Um, the European Space Agency and NASA talk all the time uh, there's a lot of close coordination there. So, for example, um, each of those two organizations do a, um, a decadal survey of what should be done in, the, say, the next decade. And, um, you know, if NASA is doing something in one area, the Europeans tend not to try and do it in exactly the same. They try and do something that complements it. Or if the Europeans are doing something ambitious in one area, the U.S. either wants to partner with or do something complementary. So, for example, the uh, Europeans are taking the lead on the next big X-ray observatory, but the U.S. is participating in that. So there's a lot of coordination that goes on, not, and not just with Europe, but with the Canadians and the Japanese and others as well. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, for the question, and um, thanks, uh, Dr. Simbach, for, for the answer. Uh, Mary, you have the next question. Would you like to go off mute and ask that? Sure. So um, I'm currently going into my senior year of undergraduate at U Chicago, and I'm currently at the point where I'm trying to decide whether grad school uh, versus other opportunities would be right for me. And I was wondering if there are particularly astrophysics oriented positions that are um, just in general open to people with a bachelor's degree in astrophysics? Uh, sure, Marie, that's a good question. And the answer is yes, there are. Um, there are a lot of positions where um, uh, data analysts are needed. So in a lot of cases, you can be doing many of the same kinds of things uh, in terms of analyzing data and moving science programs forward um, just with a bachelor's degree that you would have had if you had, say, a PhD. Um, organizations like mine, the Space Telescope Science Institute, hires uh, people right out of school. Oftentimes, we hire uh, people with bachelor's degrees. They work with us for a few years, and then they decide, oh, actually, I like this enough. I'm going to go back to grad school. You know, I'm going to go to grad school. Um, in a few cases, we've even hired them back out of grad school. Um, the government centers, Goddard, Marshall, uh, JPL, hire people with bachelor's degrees, again, to work on various programs, um, either research-type programs or missions. Uh, there are things that you can do on uh, space missions. 
the national observatories hire people, the ground-based national observatories hire people who have bachelor's degree. And um, so, yeah, the, the trick is to just make sure that you're looking at those job boards and, um, and again, talking with people. You probably have a, a senior advisor, a, a senior uh, project advisor at the university that can give you a little bit more information about that. But talk to some of the grad students too there. That would be a good thing to do. Talk to some of the UC grad students there and see what they say. Um, it's good that you're thinking about that. Thank you very much. That's sure. uh, really Thanks a lot, Dr. Simbach. And um, uh, any, any closing thoughts, um, guidance from your end? Uh, from mine? Yep. Um, I'll just say, um, again, I think that um, there are lots of opportunities in the space area. Um, I know we've talked a lot about astronomy and astrophysics today, um, but for those who are interested in space in general, I think in the coming years, there's going to be a lot more attention paid to Earth sciences. Uh, climate change is on us. Um, Regardless of why it's occurring, uh, the climate is definitely changing and needs to be understood for all kinds of reasons. Um, so I think that there will be more work in that area and more resource, resources from the federal government diverted to the area. Uh, the same is probably true from space weather. So heliophysics is also an area I think that's going to be getting a lot of attention. Um, these are not um, astronomy and astrophysics fields per se, but many of the skills and backgrounds and training that uh, go into astronomy and astrophysics are directly applicable to addressing the problems that we're seeing in those particular areas uh, now and in the coming years. And so for people looking for jobs or thinking longer term about a career trajectory, I would definitely keep that in mind as well. Thanks a lot, Dr. Simbach. And uh, uh, thank you for taking time. Uh, it, I think it was a great session. Um, we are getting quite some comments from the audience that uh, that they, they liked it. Uh, Josh has shared, for everyone in the, in the audience, Josh has shared our LinkedIn, the link to our LinkedIn group, and also, um, uh, you know, the link to the subscription to our newsletter and uh, the, the astrophysics um, uh, department at, at University of Chicago. So uh, thank you for taking time and thanks a lot, Dr. Simbach, for, for sharing your experience, experience and enlightening us um, you know, with, uh, with all that you are doing, which is, uh, which is amazing. You're very welcome. And I think it's great that this forum exists for conversations like this. Um, I, congratulations and kudos to the organizers for for keeping it going and producing such a good series. It's been been a pleasure today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.